well. So um, without further ado, I will now um, welcome you formally to this evening, which is the Christchurch Bay and Harbour Flood and Coastal Erosion Risk Management. This is the FSM strategy and this is engagement round five for elected members. I understand some of you may be new, so it's lovely. Hello, welcome from all of us and you'll be meeting the team um, on this evening, 12th of June. And just to let you know, we will be using the chat function, which you'll find um, at the top of the screen on the far left. If you click on there, you'll see um, the chat come up. You can always put questions in there. Um, alternatively, there'll be options. Uh, there'll be question slides where you can ask questions after certain sections. You can also um, put your virtual hand up, which you'll see at the top of the screen as well. There's a raise and a little hand there. And my colleague Nikki and I will be keeping an eye on that. OK, so I will let you know what we're doing this evening. Um, so, Alan, can you move on to the next slide? Ah, you already have. Well done. We've done this before. OK, so um, I'm going to introduce you all to the project team. Going to have run through the aims of this event. We'll be reintroducing also um, the FSM strategy, the progress since January 2023. Introducing the draft proposed leading options that are now being consulted on and also um, talk to you about how you can help inform the FSM strategy at this stage of the project. And then we'll be finalising with the next steps following the consultation period. OK, thank you. Next slide, please. On these marvellous photographs. OK, so uh, the project team who you'll be speaking to tonight. So on the call, oh, Alan's hiding it from me. On the call, uh, we do have Alan Frampton. He's from BCP Council. He's the FSM Strategy Policy and Environmental Manager and the Client Project Manager. Also, welcome to Peter, Peter Ferguson. He's the new Forest District Council Coastal Projects Engineer. And then we have Ben Taylor, who's from ACOM, who is a Consultant Project um, Manager. Also on the call, we should have um, Matt Hosey, who's the head of SM from BCP Council. I'm sure you're aware of that. Welcome, Matt. Also, Dave Pixley from um, the Environment Agency. He's the senior coastal advisor. We have Steve Cook from New Forest District Council as well. Welcome, Steve. And also Catherine Corbin, who is the FSM stakeholder engagement um, from BCP. So welcome to you all. And we shall move on to the aims of this evening. So number one, um, we'll be raising awareness of the work that is being done to develop the Christchurch Bay and Harbour FSM strategy, how and when we will be engaging and communicating through the progress. The team will take you through that. We'll be um, asking the project team to feedback on the progress since January 2023. We'll also be introducing the draft proposed leading options that are now being consulted on and finally to seek comments from stakeholders on the draft proposed leading options and we definitely want your views on these. Okay, so there'll be lots of opportunities to ask questions as we go on. Thank you. So we are doing a first poll. So on your screen, you should see poll one. The question is, which council are you representing this evening? You have your choices there. Please just click on the little box next to the choice and submit. I can hear some lovely bird sound. That's actually quite calming. It's gone now. OK, great. Hopefully everybody has clicked on their responses. Yeah, we have from BCP Council, 46%, New Forest District Council, 23%, Hampshire. Oh, no, we've changed, changed minds or it's changed the decision. 7% from Hampshire down to 21% New Forest. Um, BCP Town and Parish Councils, 21%. Um, at the moment, it's saying there is no one from New Forest Town and Parish Councils. Is that correct? If you are, please just click on the poll. OK. Right. If everyone has done, we will record that. Thank you very much for your poll one. 
OK, poll two. OK, again, we're just asking you a quick question about the area we're going to be talking about this evening that you are most interested in and you have a list. Hopefully you can all see that. Put a hand up if you've got any problem with that. Just click on the one that you're most interested in or if it's all of the above, you can submit that too. Catherine, you have your hand up. Hi there. I'm just just wanted to say that the polls are not popping up on my screen. Um, oh. So if anybody else is experiencing that, if you go to the top of the screen and look at chat, there's a bubble like a speech bubble called chat. And then you scroll down on the right hand side, you'll see the polls in the meeting chat. Thanks, Catherine. OK. OK. Right, so let's have a little look. So it's quite a wide range. We'll make a note of that. Thank you for your responses. We've had 12, so we will move on. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. So without further ado, do. Um, I'm going to move over to Alan Frampton, who's going to reintroduce um, the FSM strategy. Um, Alan, the floor is yours. Please remember, if you have any questions, you can pop them into the chat. Just type in there or raise your hand or wait for our opportunity for Q&As, which will come shortly. Thank you, Alan. Thanks, Sarah. So we, we do this every round of engagement. Uh, we're aware that uh, some people may have been to a previous event but not everyone so just to reintroduce what it is we're doing with the strategy so the aim of, the, of this project uh, and getting a strategy in place is to set out the long-term approach to sustainable management of coastal flood and erosion risks in an integrated way across the Christchurch Bay and Harbour strategy area over the next 100 years taking into account um, latest science and evidence and projections of climate change. So our strategy area goes from Hengsbury Head Longway in the west, follows round the open coast to Hurst Bit in the east, and in, uh, encompasses the Christchurch Harbour area up to Tuckton Bridge on the River Stour and Nat Mill on the River Raven. And on this map here, you'll see the orange section, Hurst Bit to Limington strategy. That's uh, equivalent uh, strategy being developed at the moment. Uh, in a project with an environment agency in New Forest, covering Hurst Bit itself, going up to Limington. Um, both projects are doing a very similar thing, and we've been coordinating um, closely as we've developed um, to make sure the options we both come up with, particularly around Milford and transitioning to Hurst Spit, are aligned, which I'm pleased to say they are. Um, and this is building on the shoreline management plan policies that were adopted in 2011. The policy set out the long term strategic vision and, and approach to sustainable management and what the strategy does is add to the detail of how those policies are implemented and in doing so we look again at the evidence and, and sense check the SMP policies. Across the strategy area we've got a large number of properties at potential risk of coastal flooding particularly in the next 100 years so by year 100, under a one in 200 year extreme event, there's potentially 2,200 or so properties at risk of flooding. That's on a projection of sea level rise of just over one metre over the next century. Most of those flood risk um, properties are within Christchurch Harbour area. And then on the open coast, we've got uh, a growing number of properties at risk if we do nothing from coastal erosion. So you can see here that by year 100, of the strategy, which is our planning horizon, there's 1,370 properties at potential risk of erosion along the coast, and that's within these um, blue, uh, amber and red zones on these maps I've just flicked through. So as I said, the, the strategy is working out the detail of how to implement the intended shoreline management plan policy. Once adopted by the Environment Agency's large project review group, which we hope to achieve um, next spring, that will give us the basis for progressing um, more localised schemes to actually implement works on the ground. Uh, and this sets up the business case piece for that work um, is where we, we go to write the detail of the business case and secure the funding. 
how we've been developing the strategy. We've be, we've been uh, going at this since um, April, Mar uh, March, April 2021. We've been going through a stage process with engagement at key points throughout. So you can see here the blue points on the project where we've engaged during it. We're nearly there. This is the moment where we come to our leading proposed uh, options and seeking views on that, um, which is what we're going to present to you tonight to start off that engagement round five. So our last engagement round was uh, from end of November to mid January this year. And since then, we've taken all the feedback we received um, in that round that's confirmed and finalised our shortlist of options. And then Ben and his team at ACOM have been doing the more detailed technical, economic, environmental and social appraisal of that shortlist. And that's led to the draft proposed leading options we're going to present to you tonight. Alongside that, there's all the uh, necessary statutory environmental reporting we have to do that goes with a, a project like this. So there is a strategic environmental assessment that's available online. And then there are other habitat regulation, marine conservation zone and water framework directive assessments um, that are being prepared as well. In terms of how the options have been developed and appraised, we've broken the, the strategy area up into six strategic management zones or SMZs, and with each of those subdivided further into a, a number of option development units. So we look at the options in each option development unit and then in combination within the SMZ and then in combination across the strategy area to look at the interactions between them. And they're appraised on a multi criteria. Um, basis that was informed in one of the previous engagement rounds with stakeholders guiding what the, those criteria should be. In terms of the options that have come out, every option development unit has at least a national economic leading option. So that is the option we are guided to select by following the uh, nationally set um, flood and coastal erosion risk management appraisal guidance rules um, and following treasury rules. In some locations, taking on board uh, feedback we've had through the engagement, we may or may not have uh, identified a local aspirational leading option. These are typically options that uh, would build upon and enhance the national leading option. It might be it's doing more to improve and deliver wider benefits, and typically it will require a, for a greater amount of funding contribution than the national leading option. So it's more expensive, but delivers more. And then in some places we've identified what we're calling a backup option. That's recognising that in some locations the funding contribution needs are quite significant and we're uncertain if we would um, achieve those. Um, so should that not be possible, we've identified what would happen in those that circumstance. So this slide just sets out the appraisal process um, that's been gone through. So it starts off with an economic appraisal. Uh, looking at the options, that gives us our provisional national option. Then iterate around the social environmental appraisal, looking at how those considerations influence and do you need to reconsider the, the provisional option, confirm the national option. Then we look at the local desires and aspirations and decide whether we needed a local option. And then we fed into looking at the funding challenge and decided whether we needed a backup option. So that's the framework that's been gone through um, in iteration through this. In terms of uh, what Ben's going to be showing uh, shortly in terms of each option development unit, it's laid out in this format. So we've got, um, depending on whether there's one, two or three of the approaches, we've got a, a pathway uh, and it sets out the approach in the short term, which is the next 20 years, then the medium term, which is uh, 20 to 50 years and then the long term 50 to 100 years and the idea of setting them out in the path this pathway is that depending on where you're going you might start off doing the national option but suddenly you, you secure an extra amount of funding and you might actually be able to switch to the local option for example there are some pathways where you might get to a point though where the switching um, track may not be possible for example if you've gone down a route of stopping defending an area you're unlikely to reinstate um, so but it gives us flexibility in in progressing the strategy and implementing it as we move forward 
there's been some testing of the uncertainty in some of the decision making, particularly around rates of sea level rise and potential cost increases. It's been a big challenge with construction costs of late. Um, so we've tested the sensitivity options and what would happen if if some of the assumptions made um, were different. And then we've considered the impact on adjacent units if any of the options were to go ahead or not go ahead, what would be the implications on the connected units? Um, and are there any key linkages we need to be aware of where where that relationship is, is important to bear in mind when we make a decision? But, so that's my piece. We uh, can take questions at that point. Thank you, Alan. Um, so if you have any questions at this point, do raise your hand using the virtual raise hand or you can pop them into the chat. Any questions for Alan on what you've just heard? Nope, no. Nope. OK. I can't see any, so I'm feeling confident we can move on, um, Ben. So. Thank you. Alan, if you could pop the next slide on and um, Ben, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that. So yeah, for the next half an hour to, to 45 minutes or so, um, I'll be providing an overview of the draft proposed leading options that we've identified. Um, these are by no means set in stone. Uh, we will be considering feedback from the public and key stakeholders on these over the coming months and making uh, updates accordingly. Uh, there'll be a number of polls um, to ask for your feedback as we progress through the coastal frontage. So it won't just be me speaking to you for 45 minutes non-stop. Um, we'll start um, with SMZ1, which, which is at the western end um, of our coastal frontage, uh, covering the Mudderford Sandbank area. We'll then move around the harbour uh, in a clockwise direction um, and then along the open coast to the east until we reach Milford on Sea. So starting with SMZ1, uh, it includes the, the southeastern frontage of Hengisbury Head, uh, just the east of the Long Groin and then also Mudderford Sandbank. Uh, this area is uh, important for recreation with many beach huts and it's also a popular area for visitors to the area. In terms of its flood and erosion function, uh, Mudderford Sandbank provides shelter to Christchurch Harbour. Um, there are also a number of buried services and utilities that run beneath the sandbank and connect to Mudderford Quay. However, in terms of risks to permanent properties, there, there are very few properties in this location, which really limits the amount of central government funding that may be available for coastal defences here. Uh, next slide, please, Alan. Thanks. So ODU1, um, this is the southeastern frontage of Hengisbury Head. Uh, the option selection in this location has really been focused on working with the existing defences as best as possible. Um, due to there being no permanent properties here um, to drive a business in an economic case, there's really little justification for constructing new defences here at this point in time. The national economic option um, in this location reflects this uh, and the economic option is, is due minimum. Uh, this would involve undertaking small scale maintenance to the existing defences over time, aiming to extend the service life of the assets. However, there is uncertainty as to how long this may be feasible because as sea levels rise and defences get older, it's unlikely that these small scale maintenance interventions will keep the defences functioning as they currently are. This could lead to erosion of the cliff uh, in a more uncontrolled manner uh, in the future, which would be more difficult to manage. We've therefore selected a, a local aspirational option here too, um, which would be delivered if funding could be found to support it. Uh, the local aspirational option is mandatory alignment. Uh, this would involve more investment into the existing defences to ensure that they remain functional throughout the next 100 years. It would also involve beach management, most likely beach recycling uh, to support the defences. This would help enable the cliff to be controlled over time to provide confidence in the evolution of the coastline and to, and to reduce the risks of any un unexpected erosion from happening. Uh, but you can see the estimated difference in costs between those two options around is around six million over the next 100 years. Uh, next slide, please. 
So ODU2, this, this covers Mudderford Sandback itself, both on the seaward side and on the harbour side. Uh, this area has similar funded constraints to ODU1, as there are very few permanent properties on the sandbank, sandbank. so central, government, so central funding government funding is, funding is yeah, likely to be limited. 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 Similar to ODU1, uh, the national economic option is, is do minimum. Um, this would involve small scale maintenance uh, to the existing defences, such as the rock groins and the seawall. Um, again, there's uncertainty with how this would evolve in the future um, without more investment there is a risk of the sandbank either rolling back into the harbour um, or even localised breaching could occur if beach levels drop too low the local aspirational option here um, it aims to provide more certainty in this location by investing more into the existing defences for example by refurbishing the defences periodically when they get close to the end of their service life it also involves a beach nourishment scheme in the future to top up the beach levels on the sandbank should it be needed. Uh, and the aim of this local aspirational option is to preserve the flood and erosion defence function of the sandbank, both for the beach huts on the sandbank and the visitors to the sandbank, but also to the wider benefit that the sandbank provides to Christchurch Harbour in terms of providing that shelter from the waves. It will also ensure that access in and out of the harbour is not negatively impacted uh, for long periods of time and it will serve the buried services or help preserve the buried services underneath the sandbank too to ensure they're not interrupted by erosion. It does, however, uh, require significantly more investment with costs over the next 100, year, 100 years estimated to be around £15 million. Um, so yeah, next slide, please. So yeah, we have a poll um, to just get your feedback on those options. I appreciate I've run through them quite quickly, um, but in principle, it would just be good to get your feedback, whether you're broadly satisfied or dissatisfied with those proposed leading options in, in SMZ1. OK, thank you, Ben. So um, you should be able to see the poll on your screen. If not, you can, as Catherine said before, pop into the chat and you'll also see the poll um, in there and then just press your submit and we will record everybody as it comes through. So we've had eight responses, so just keep popping them in. Thank you very much. And if you joined us late, um, welcome. I'm Sarah from Dorset Coast Forum. My colleague Nikki and I are facilitating um, tonight's meeting. You can use your chat function to put questions, or there will be opportunities for questions as we go through as well. Thank you. We have 12 responses. Any more? OK, great. So. Ben will be pleased to know there was zero on dissatisfied, Ben. 53% um, neither satisfied or dissatisfied and 46 satisfied. OK, thank you. Next slide, please, Alan, for Ben. OK, great. So moving on to SMZ2, which covers uh, Christchurch Harbour. Um, this area has a lot of different option development units from three up to 11. Um, there are a number of different risks within the harbour. I think the, the primary risk is uh, the large number of properties that are expected to be at risk from tidal flooding um, in the future as sea levels rise. We've also got several historic landfill sites um, that are located adjacent to the harbour that if left undefended could erode in the future and potentially release uh, contaminated materials into the environment. There are also several European and national uh, environmental designations that we need to be aware of and work towards lim limiting our impact on or even improving. Uh, I'll go into the detail in each of the, each of the different ADUs in the coming slides, but I think in essence the leading options around the harbour are focused on improving the defences in low-lying areas at different points in time as determined by the rate of sea level rise and the onset of risk but then also providing erosion defences to the historic landfill sites uh, dotted around the harbour. Next slide, please. OK, so starting with um, ODU3, which is on the south side of the harbour. We'll work around clockwise from here. Um, ODU3 is it's largely undefended at the moment. There are only a few properties at risk here. Uh, but there are two large areas of historic landfill that we need to consider, um, as well as the key access road onto Modiford Sandbank via Hengersbury Head. 
Uh, ODU3 is another area where due to relatively few properties here, there's generally quite a poor economic case to invest large amounts in new defences here. So the national economic option here is focused on adaptation and resilience. Uh, it would involve undertaking small scale property level protection and resilience measures on an individual property by property basis where properties are at risk from flooding. It's also generally quite a low cost option, um, but it doesn't help manage the risks associated with potential erosion of the two historic landfill sites. So we've also got a local aspirational option. This goes a step further. Uh, it looks to address the, the risk to the landfill sites um, in addition to the property level protection that would be undertaken as part of the national option. The local option also includes small scale erosion defences around the historic landfill site at Wick um, and also the access road towards Mudder Sandbank, which would also defend the historic landfill site there. Uh, the need for erosion defences around the historic landfill sites, it's, it is subject to investigations in the future into the contaminated status of those areas. Um, currently, there is relatively little known about the makeup of those sites, so we have been fairly conservative at this stage in assuming that they do need to be defended. Next slide, please. Okay, so ADU4, um, this is located just to the, the northwest of ADU3. Uh, it covers the urban, urban area of Wick, where the flood risk is expected to increase significantly in the future. Uh, there's currently a setback flood embankment located on the northeast corner of this unit that provides some flood protection in that location. And the National Economic Option recommends extending and raising this defence over time in several increments as and when sea levels rise, which will reduce the flood risk in this location. We've also got a, his a historic landfill site here as well, um, located just to the north of that embankment, um, adjacent to the green line in the top figure, which is the front line key wall. Um, there is a cost associated with maintaining this existing key wall that on a national basis, it, it does not lead to much in terms of economic benefits. Therefore, the national option doesn't involve actively maintaining this key wall above just small scale patch repair works. Um, so with the national option, there is a, a risk that if the key wall were to fail in the future, the historic landfill site could be subject to erosion. So recognising this, um, we've also got a local aspirational option here um, that would include proactive maintenance and refurbishment of the existing key wall there to ensure it doesn't fail in the future and, and to protect the historic landfill site. Um, the local option also inclu includes the works to improve the flood defence in the east part of the unit. Uh, but you can see that the difference in cost just associated with that key wall refurb, given that it's a frontline structure, is pretty costly, uh, talking around 7 million over the next 100 years. Uh, next slide, please. Um Ben, just before you move on to the next slide, we do have a question. I've now lost who was asking the question. You've got your hand up. You've just gone off my screen. Would you like to unmute and just ask the question? Is that OK, Ben? Yeah, of course. Councillor Hadley, would you like to ask your question? I guess it's... Uh, it, it... Sorry, yeah, it's a, we... it's a comment, really. Um, I've had. I'm, I'm Andy Hadley. I'm, I'm portfolio holder for uh, um, climate change, environment, and uh, energy, and and that includes the FSM team. Um, so I've had a bit of a preview of these slides. Um, and and you know our difficulty with these landfill sites is that there is no money from government um, to to protect them. Um, although clearly they are quite an environmental risk to uh, to to us. Um, so the team obviously have that in the in the local, and the numbers are quite scary. But the numbers are over a long time period. Um, so we will need to find out how when you see these figures flying by and we've had several of them already, um, uh, if you top them up, it comes to quite a lot of money. Um, and the question, I suppose, is over what time and how we can fund them. Um, but particularly that one, I guess there's something about what we can do to lobby central government in terms of this historic risk, which it occurs all around the coast. Unfortunately, it's something that uh, um, is a national problem, um, but there is no current funding. I just thought it was, might be worth mentioning that at this stage because you're going to come on to more of these as you go around the harbour. Thank you. OK, yeah. thanks, Andy, for that. Yeah, thanks. That's a really good point. I think it's um it's certainly an issue that's gaining more awareness and prominence recently uh, on a nationwide basis. And I think what we'll, we will be developing for the strategy is some funding profiles for these options so that there's clear visibility of when money will be needed for these options to help with that funding 
and partnership funding uh, approach. Um, so yeah, moving on to ADU5. Um, so this is located just the north of ADU4 uh, on the north bank of the River Stour. Um, the flood risk in this location is, is currently managed by a scheme that was constructed in the 90s. Um, however, over time, as, as sea level rises, the defences will need to be improved to sustain the, the high standard of protection that it provides. Um, similar to ODU 3 and 4, uh, we've also got areas of historic landfill here with, that need to be managed too, um, the largest of which is adjacent to the Quamps Recreation Ground. This is an area where there's, there's actually quite a large number of properties that are expected to be at risk of flooding. Um, therefore, there is a reasonably strong economic case to improve the defences. Um, the national economic option here involves improving the defences from Epoch 2, so between 2040-2070 time period. Um, the local, eco local economic option, um, sorry, the local aspirational option involves doing this much sooner um, in Epoch 1. And the benefit of doing it sooner would be to provide confidence around the standard of protection, um, as well as defending the historic landfill site at the Quamps, as a capital scheme would involve replacing or maintaining existing frontline wall there. In terms of the alignment for the new defences, um, there are a number of different routes that, that could be taken here. The strategies identified a few of them, um, either a setback alignment, a frontline alignment, or even a combination of the two. It's not something that will be able to bottom out at the strategy level, so that alignment decision will need to be taken further down the line during further design work. Um, but in preparation for that, we are seeking public and stakeholder views on those alignments during this consultation period to get an idea of what a preference may be. Um, the options here again do have a, a high cost uh, estimated upwards of, of 25 million. Um, due to the number of properties here, that are at risk, we would expect several million of funding from central government to help with the scheme here, but there would still be quite a large shortfall in funding. Um, so recognising that, we, we've also developed a backup option here, um, which would be more deliverable, uh, wouldn't have such a large one-off cost associated with the capital scheme. Um, and the backup option is essentially to maintain the existing defences and then to also undertake property level protection and resilience measures on a property by property basis uh, as required. Next slide, please. So ODU 6, uh, this spans the west bank of the River Avon uh, up to Knapp Mill. Uh, there are primarily two areas here that are expected to be at increased flood risk in the future. Uh, the southern extent around Elkins Boatyard and then in the vicinity around Castle Street uh, further to the north. Um, in order to defend both these areas with new flood defences, relatively long lengths of defences would be required, um, which are just far too costly relative to the properties that they would defend, which are a relatively small number, um, leading to a relatively weak economic case here. So recognising that the approach that we've identified for the national option um, is therefore one of adaptation and resilience, which would involve managing the flood risk at a property by property basis through provision of property flood resilience measures and, and protection measures, whilst also maintaining existing key walls and, and, and such. Next slide, please. So ADU7, uh, this is uh, Rosters Key. So this is essentially the island in the middle of the River Avon with channels on either side. Um, there's a number of existing defences currently in this location which provide a, a reasonable standard of protection at the moment. Um, given that this is the case, there's new defences aren't really required in this location immediately. Um, the National Economic Option recommends improving the defences or constructing new defences from Epoch 2 onwards. Um, it is likely to be techni technically quite challenging to do that in this location. There's significant space constraints with buildings right on the edge of the, uh, the shore acting as de facto defences at the moment. Um, but assuming that the defences can be raised, the estimated cost for that national option is around 7 million. Um, we've identified a backup option here too, um, which would not require such a large funding amount um, for a capital scheme. And again, may, may be more deliverable. Um, the backup option would involve 
tackling the increase in flood risk on a property by property basis again with property level protection like similar areas adjacent to it. Next slide please. Okay, so we've jumped forward to ODU 9, we've actually skipped ODU 8, um, and the reason for that is it's much further up uh, the River Avon, uh, north of the bypass, um, and we've agreed with the Environment Agency to that the option development of that location will be led by a different project that, that they're leading on, given that the, the, the flood risk there is more fluvial, fluvial dominated. But at ODU 9, um, this is at Stampit, this is located just east of, of ODU 7, um, on the east bank of the River Avon. There are two main risks here, similar to the rest of the, the harbour really, tidal flood risk, tidal and fluvial flood risk um, coming from the Avon and, and the harbour side, and then also the risk of erosion to the historic landfill sites um, located beneath Stampit Recreation Ground. The flood risk here is quite extensive in the future, so there's a strong economic case for improving the defences. Um, the National Economic Option recommends improving the defences from Epoch 2 when the flood risk would otherwise be expected to increase. Uh, there's currently a flood defence scheme shown in the yellow on the figure top left um, in the north part of the unit, and it's likely that the upgraded defences could follow a similar alignment to what's currently there. In the south part of the unit around Stampit Recreation Ground, the defences would need to be improved too, so raised and strengthened to prevent erosion of the historic landfill and also the flood risk coming from this direction. Uh, as part of this option, we've also signposted that there may be opportunities to enhance um, and even restore salt marsh habitats adjacent to Stampit Recreation Ground in the future, uh, and these opportunities should be explored in the future. Um, Salt marsh provides a natural coastal defence by attenuating wave energy, but in the future sea level rise threatens the salt marsh habitat as it would become more and more inundated over time. Um, improving the salt marsh habitat in the future would make it more resilient to this change. Uh, it provide a biodiversity net gain um, and would also help with the, the flood and erosion risk in the area. So again, the national economic option fairly costly in this location of the order of, of 20 million, 21 million. Um, however, we can expect around about three million of that to be funded from central government. Um, we've put the backup option here, um, similar to elsewhere, adaptation and resilience based on maintaining existing defences and working on a property by property basis to provide resistance and resilient resilience measures. Next slide, please. Sorry, PowerPoint's just decided to That's kill all right. <laughs> um, I'm just going to turn it off and on again. Try and entertain everybody while we're <laughs> waiting. Or has anyone got a question for Ben while we're just getting that? Please put well, your hand. I was up. just going to say, Sarah, sorry to interrupt. I've just added to the chat um, that there was a coastal landfill site um, uh, programme which featured on Panorama recently. So I've put the details in the chat there. So if you want to have a look at it, you can you can have a look and see that it is a national problem and what's happening about that. So the details are in the chat. Thanks. Great. Sarah. Thanks, Catherine. Has anyone got any questions as we wait? For hours oh, coming. Any questions? Please unmute. Oh, uh, just omitting somebody else. So, Sarah, I was just going to say while Alan's talking about that, I know he's there at the moment. Um, sorry, it's Matt mm -hmm. Hosey here. It's just to add Hi, to, Matt. To, just to add to Councillor Hadley's point around the sort of landfill sites and you know the the, the one of the benefits of us looking at those local options, which from a strategy perspective, um, you know, aren't affordable via flood defence grant and aid. In, in its own right, but it gives us the ability in future to to um, take advantage when there's changes in rules. You know, for example, as as Councillor Hadley said, you know, there's there's national lobbying on um, coastal landfill sites, and and um, you know, central government are looking at you know what the issue looks like financially, you know, um, across the whole nation, and and you know, there's there's answers to be had there because it's a, a risk 
nationally and and also you know when the strategy gets approved we were also um subject to funding rule changes over time so who knows what the flood defense grant made funding rules changes will be um in in the coming years we had one in june 2020 which which increased costs for for um for people costs so so yeah so the fact that it's unaffordable by a flood defense grant made doesn't mean we can't find alternative funding or apply funding rule changes in in um future years so yeah, I'll leave it at that and now Alan carry on. So it's Great, coming back through again. It uh, did, yeah, it was very working. fuzzy yeah. and I thought it might be me. But it, yeah. it's back nice and clear now. So if you just want to yeah. go to um your slideshow. I think forwards. we're on ten, I think. Yeah, ten we start. are indeed. Does that come up? Yeah. Yes. yes. And oh. we're off and running again. Thank you, Ben. Sorry for that. But That's we're right, on time. Right. You're doing well. Thank you. Okay, so OD10, um, promise at the end of the harbour section now. Um, it covers the, the Mudderford frontage between Stanpit uh, in the west and then Mudderford Quay in the east. Uh, the land slowly rises as you move away from the shoreline here. So the flood cells essentially a long linear flood envelope covering the, the first part closest to the sea of the frontage. Um, many of the properties along this part of the frontage you already have property level resilience and protection measures some are, all, are raised up um, to account for that flood risk um, but with sea level rise we, we do expect the flood risk to worsen over time here um, based on the development and onset of the risk um, the national economic option involves constructing new defenses or raising the existing key walls um, from epoch three um, in the interim period it's, it's recommended that properties continue to manage the flood risk on a property by property basis um, whilst maintaining that frontline key wall. Again, it's a, it's a frontline scheme here. It's quite costly. Uh, we're estimating costs between 25, 30 million as a whole, with around 10 percent of that likely to come from central government funding. Um, so again, likely to be a large shortfall here. Um, we've got a backup option uh, as well, um, which again, adaptation resilience managing that risk on a property by property basis, which will be a much lower cost approach. Um, next slide, please. I do believe it's our poll, is it up? Oh no, we've got one Just more one before more. the poll. Yeah. Okay, so this is the last Thanks, one. So ADU 11, it, it covers the Mudderford Key area. Um, relative to other parts of Christchurch Harbour, there are very few properties here um, that are at risk from flooding. Um, so building an economic case for large scale new flood defences is, is very difficult. The national economic option is to do minimum, which would involve essentially small scale patch repairs to the existing key walls and setback defences here. Um, we've also identified a local aspirational option, um, which would involve undertaking more proactive maintenance of that key wall, as well as property level protection uh, to properties on the key. Uh, and the local option would just provide more confidence in the long term functioning of those key walls, which are important for the overall morphology and navigation in this area. OK, so I think that's it on to the poll, please. Same as before. Um, OK. Great, so you should see the poll on screen. Um, Councillor Luscombe, I have emailed you. We'll, we'll make sure we get your answers uh, recorded. If anyone else has got any issue with the um, polls please just put it in the chat and Nikki and I will make sure you guess all the the polls and we record all your answers but the question is are you broadly satisfied dissatisfied with the proposed leading options to manage the flood and erosion risk in SMZ2 that you've just been hearing about okay so I've had eight responses any more nine just wait a couple more seconds Okay. Right. We hit 12 earlier, so I'm just going to see if we hit it again. No, we've got 11 in. Um, ben, um, zero on dissatisfied, 72%, neither satisfied or dissatisfied, and 33% satisfied. So we'll record that. Um, and as I say, we'll make sure if you haven't been able to vote, we will get your votes in. OK, moving on, Ben, the floor is yours. OK, um, so SMZ3, this covers the area of open coast between Mudderford Quay 
uh, and then Chewton Bully just to the east of Highcliffe. Um, the risks here are very different to the harbour area. Uh, the primary risk here is erosion of the cliff line, which could lead to loss of properties on the cliff top in the future if that's not managed. We've got two ODUs here. We've got ODU 12 and then ODU 13. So next slide, please. So starting with ODU 12, uh, this spans the area between Mudford Quay and then just to the east of Steamer Point. Um, the topography gets higher, uh, moving west to east along the frontage, and the frontage is currently defended by a combination of groins, which help to hold the beach in place and a seawall promenade at the top of the beach. As sea levels rise over time, the existing defences are likely to become under increasing pressure. Uh, and we need to be replaced, refurbished or, or raised to provide the same standard of protection that we currently do. The national economic option here uh, involves maintaining existing defences in the short term uh, before constructing new groins and undertaking a beach nourishment scheme in the medium term. This would add more beach material to the area, which would provide that first line of defence and help the beaches, at the, and, sorry, help the defence at the top of the beach. It also help encourage the continued use of the area for recreation, tourism, uh, by providing a healthy, healthy beach volume here. The local aspirational option goes a, a step further than the national economic option. Uh, it involves undertaking the groin upgrades and beach nourishment scheme much sooner, so during Epoch 1. Uh, this would provide greater confidence over the first 20 years in the defence system. Um, and in addition, as part of the local aspiration option, we've also included a provision for broader public realm improvements, such as promenade raising, for example. The cost of the national uh, and local options are estimated to be between 17 to, to 21 million here, um, but the local option cost could vary substantially subject to the, the scale of any public realm improvements that, that are undertaken. Um, similar to the majority of the, the costs along the option for Along the strategy frontage, uh, a comparatively small amount of central government funding is expected to be available. Um, this is just characteristic of long erosion schemes such as this, um, where long lengths of defence are needed to protect relatively fewer properties. Um, we've also identified a backup option here um, in case funding cannot be found. Uh, this is essentially a scaled back version of the, the national or local option um, using a smaller amount of beach nourishment material and a smaller scale of defence improvements. Next slide, please. Okay, so AD 13, uh, this covers the Highcliffe area from Highcliffe Castle to the eastern end of the defences um, towards Chute and Bunny. Um, this area has got similar risks to the adjacent ADU 12. Um, Currently, the coastline here at the eastern end of the unit is well defended um, with a rock revetment and rock groins and a very successful cliff stabilisation scheme. There is, however, a risk of outflanking of those defences in the future if the cliff at Naish continues to erode. The national economic option uh, involves constructing outflanking defences at the eastern end of the unit in Epoch 1. Um, maintenance of this defence would then occur and also to the current defences. Um, and then in Epoch 3, uh, a beach nourishment scheme would be undertaken if required to top up beach levels that could become increasingly threatened due to sea level rise. At the time of doing that beach nourishment scheme, um, it would also be necessary to replace or refurbish the existing rock revetment and rock groins as they reach the end of their service life. The local aspirational option is, is very similar to the national economic option, uh, except that the major beach nourishment scheme would be undertaken much sooner, uh, likely during Epoch 2. Uh, again, this would provide more confidence in the medium term by bringing forward that intervention. Backup option here, uh, similar to ODU 12, it's essentially a scaled back version of the national or local option using a smaller beach nourishment volume uh, to improve affordability. OK, next slide, please. And fingers at the ready, we're back to the polls, poll five. So again, um, thanks, Ben, for that. Um, please, can you just answer quickly the poll, submit your answers. Um, don't worry if you are not able to use the polls, I will 
make sure that we get everyone's responses. So far, Ben's feeling comfortable that uh, is zero one dissatisfied. OK, they're following a similar profile, I would say. Um, we've had 13 responses, so I think we're good to go to the next section. Thanks, Ben. OK, so uh, SMZ4, um, this covers the Naish, Cliff and Bartimont Sea frontage. Uh, this is a particularly complex and challenging area to manage. Um, the geology of the cliff here makes it particularly unstable uh, with erosion of the cliff driven by two, two key processes. Um, the first being erosion of the cliff toe by waves in the sea. Uh, and then the second is instability uh, caused by groundwater and rainfall that can cause landsliding. Um, with affordability constraints associated with all coastal defence works. Um, these combinations in tandem make it particularly challenging to actually control the rate of erosion here um, and to defend the properties that are located along the cliff top. So currently, um, there's an undefended area uh, of coastline at Nash Cliff in the west part of the unit that is eroding quite quickly. Um, central and eastern parts of this frontage are a bit more stable um, but are still prone to erosion events. The area in the central and eastern part of the frontage relies on defences at the cliff toe uh, and also a cliff drainage system to reduce the rate of erosion. Uh, the cliff drainage system is largely intact in the eastern end of the frontage but has failed in many places in the central part of the unit. Next slide please. So ODU 14 is the sole unit in SMZ4 um, and given the complexities associated with the cliffs here, uh, the national and e national economic and local options recommend a mandatory alignment approach uh, and this will aim to control the rate of erosion of the cliff. It won't stop it entirely, but it will control it so that property damage can be minimised, although there, there may still be a small amount. For both options, this will involve constructing new defences at the toe of the cliff, so that the urbanised part of the frontage between Marine Drive West and the eastern part of the unit would have a robust toe defence uh, at the base of the cliff. New cliff drainage would also be installed in the areas that it has previously failed, primarily in the central part of the unit. In the western part of the unit, uh, Nash Cliff, uh, a beach nourishment scheme would take place to top up the beach levels here. This would help to provide improved toe protection to this area. Um, and could slow the rate of that cliff eroding. And then gradually over time, the beach material will be expected to drift eastwards and provide a, broad, a broader benefit to the rest of the Barton frontage and further east as well. Um, so overall, yeah, the options would not completely stop further erosion from happening, uh, but will aim to, to control and reduce the rate compared to a scenario where nothing's done. The main difference between the national and local options here come down to the timing of the intervention. Uh, the national option would involve undertaking the defence upgrades and the beach nourishment from Epoch 2 when there's a stronger economic case to do so, whereas the local option would involve doing it much sooner, so during Epoch 1. Um, both options involve extensive new defences and cliff drainage works that, yeah, they're not cheap, um, but are required to deliver these options. Um, and the estimated costs are in the ballpark of £45 million. Um, we would expect about 10% of that to come from central government funding for funding a scheme. So recognizing the, recognizing the funding shortfall, we've also got a, a backup option here, and that's just focused on maintaining the existing defenses as, as best as we can where they've not already failed. Um, this is a much lower cost solution, but it would it likely lead to more significant damages and property loss in the future, particularly in the, the western and central part of the area. So at Marine Drive West and Marine Drive, where the defences are, are struggling. OK, next slide, please. I do believe it's poll time, poll six. So um, same again, please. Submit your answers. There will be opportunity. We should have at least 10 or 15 minutes after Ben has completed all his sections for Q&A. So got 14 responses in. Have some dissatisfaction, 14% Ben at this point. 
42% either satisfied, dissatisfied, and 40% satisfied. Okay. Okay, Ben, you can move on. Thank you. We'll record all those. Thank you, Fu. Okay, so SMZ5, uh, this should be a reasonably quick one. Um, the area covers the undefended coastline between Barton on Sea and Hoddle Cliff. Um, as you can see, there's only one property at risk over the next 100 years in this location. Next slide, please. Um, so ADU 15 is the sole unit in this zone. Um, the national economic option is, is to do nothing, which would mean essentially letting the cliffs erode um, naturally. Uh, there are benefits to this. This would provide beach material to the area, which would make its way to the east and, and benefit Milford on sea. Uh, and it would also ensure that the triple SI designation of the cliff um, is not impacted by any new coastal defence works here. Um, from an economic perspective, there's just no case in constructing new defences here. So I think that's it onto the poll, please. Thank you. So we have had a couple of questions in the chat, Ben. So do you want to take them now? While it's fresh, or would you like to wait for the full Q&A after you've finished? Uh, we'll wait for the full Q&A. We'll get through the okay. last area then. Excellent. So uh, don't worry if you've popped stuff in the chat. Um, we will come back to it. It won't be lost. Thank you. And where are we at on the poll? I've moved my chat. Seven responses. Just keep um, your responses coming in. Just press that submit button. Got nine. 10. OK, we're nearly there. Thank you. OK, right, Ben, I think we can move on. Thank you. OK. OK, so our final SMZ, uh, this covers the Milford on C frontage. Um, there's really a variety of risks here. Uh, the whole frontage is at risk from coastal erosion. Uh, there's also a strong trend of, of beach erosion or beach lowering along much of this area, which is putting pressure on the defences at the top of the beach uh, and can cause instability of those defences. At the eastern end of the frontage, um, where the land level is much lower, there's also a risk of coastal erosion, sorry, coastal flooding, um, in both the open coast side from wave overtopping from the sea and also from tidal inundation via the back door via the Sturt Pond. Uh, area. The options here are primarily focused on effective beach management um, and include strategically placed beach nourishment schemes. Um, and the area will also benefit from any beach nourishment that may have occurred to the to the west of this, so at High Cliff, um, Barton Sea, for example. Uh, next slide, please. So starting with ADU 16, um, this is the ADU at the western end of SMZ6. Um, currently, most of the units undefended. Uh, there are many beach huts at the cliff toe and a key car park is located at the cliff top. If nothing's done here, uh, we'd expect erosion to result in loss of the beach huts, uh, erosion of the cliff top and then damage or loss of cliff road um, in the future, which could impact access to the west and east. The national economic option um, and local aspirational option are focused on controlling the rate of erosion in the future so that Cliff, rem cliff Road remains defended. Uh, this should be achieved by undertaking a beach nourishment scheme to create a, a wide beach in this location and defend the cliff toe. And there'd also be construction of a new localised defence that would act as a strong point to help hold the shoreline in place either side. Both the national and, and local options are termed as, as mandatory alignment, um, as some erosion of the cliff would inevitably occur in this location. Uh, but through the interventions proposed, that erosion and that rate of erosion would be controlled. Uh, the difference between the national and local options here uh, purely relate to timing. Um, the national option delays the, the beach nourishment and defence works until later in Epoch 2, whilst the local option brings us forward into Epoch 1. Um, the local option would provide certainly provide more certainty and would likely result in less overall erosion of the cliff line um, overall. Um, estimated costs um, of, the, of the national and local are in the region of nine to twelve million. Um, 
And we've also got a backup option here, which involves more scale beach management uh, and maintenance of the defences in the east part of the unit. Um, this maintain option would provide less control on the rate of erosion. Um, so the cliff and, and more land would be expected to be lost over time, but it is a potentially more deliverable slash lower cost approach. Next slide, please. So ADU 17, so this is just to the east of where we were. Uh, this covers the Rook Cliff area. Uh, this area is currently a rock revetment along the majority of the frontage here. Uh, some sections also have a sea wall behind that revetment. Um, the effectiveness of the defences here, if nothing's done, would be expected to reduce over time as sea levels rise, uh, leading to erosion off the cliff and, and also failure of the defences. The national economic option involves maintaining existing defences during Epoch 1 and then upgrading the defences in Epoch 2 so they can perform as intended with higher sea levels in the future. The local aspirational option is similar to the national, uh, except that it involves upgraded upgrading the defences much sooner during Epoch 1, again, to provide more certainty in the short term. Again, quite costly solutions here um, relative to the benefits that they deliver. Um, this is largely to the setback nature of the, a lot of the properties here and also the long length of the defences needed. Estimated costs of between 14 and, and 17 million here. Um, we've got a backup option of ex essentially just maintaining the existing rock revetment and groins as they are. Um, however, with the trend of beach lowering that we've, that we've witnessed here, there is question marks over the sustainability of that backup option in the long term. Um, as falling beach levels would put pressure on those defences and make it more challenging to just maintain. Next slide, please. So this is the ADU 18, it's the final unit uh, to talk through. Um, it's at the very eastern end of the strategy uh, area adjacent to, to her spit. Currently, it's defended by a, a sea wall and groins, uh, and the beach is widely used by the public. It's one of the few areas with disabled access on down onto the beach uh, in, in the location. It's a key feature for the recreation value of the area. Um, however, being backed by a hard defence such as the sea wall, the beach is particularly vulnerable here to erosion and lowering in the future as sea levels rise, as the beach wouldn't be able to migrate uh, or adapt over time. Therefore, both the national and local options are focused on how to manage that beach and a large beach nourishment scheme is recommended as part of both of those options. This would be undertaken alongside seawall upgrades to raise the height of the defence to reduce wave, the wave overtopping risk and also new groins to help hold that beach material in place. In addition, um, as you can see in the bottom figure by the pink line, um, a new setback defence on the Sturt Pond side of the area would also be required to prevent the backdoor flood risk coming from that direction. Uh, the national economic option involves undertaking these defence improvements and the major beach nourishment scheme in Epoch 2, uh, whereas the local option would involve doing this much sooner in Epoch 1 to provide that increased confidence. And it means that we don't need to rely on the the currently aging structures for the duration of the next 20 years. Um, given that both options you know, involve many different types of defences to come together in combination, uh, they do have costs in the region of 18 to 21 million. Um, and again, uh, between 5 to 10 percent of that we'd expect to come from central government funding. Similar to adjacent areas, um, the fallback option is the backup option. Um, if funding cannot be secured, and that is involves just maintaining existing defences as they are. Um, but again, like ADU 17, the long term viability of this is is particularly uncertain due to the lowering beach levels here. Um, the beach nourishment scheme here, it would uh, defend this area, but it would also provide potentially provide benefit to her bit as well to the east. OK. That's okay, it. should we should we move on? Thank you, Ben, so much for that. So this is your last um, poll on the technical aspects, the options that have been put before you. If you can submit your answer quickly, it will give us at least 10 minutes for some questions for Ben and the team on what you've just heard. So you want to submit? Great, 14 responses. Thank you.
So question wise, uh, do feel free to write in the chat or put your hand up. But uh, Councillor Derek Tip, Derek, you had a question. Would you like me to read it out from the chat or would you like to unmute and ask your question? It was. Oh, please read it. Yep. OK, so I'm going backwards. So the question from uh, Councillor Tip is, how confident are you that the projected sea level rise is realistic? Is there any sign of an increase in the rate of sea level rise in recent years? Who would like to take that? I'll volunteer. Um, OK, go. Thank you, Ben. We're, we're basing our estimates off national guidance um, developed by the Environment Agency um, in DEFRA using the latest research available. Um, I, th I think it's based on the UK CP18 projections. Um, so it is the industry leading data that we are using. Um, with any of these things, there is uncertainty. Um, they provide a range of sea level rise projections based on confidence intervals. Um, the guidance that we have followed is based on the 70th percentile, um, which essentially means that there's a 70% confidence that it wouldn't be exceeded. Um, we have sensitivity test all, sensitivity tested all the options with a, a sea level rise value much higher using something called the H++ scenario. Um, and essentially it leads us to the same conclusions in terms of the, the option selection, uh, particularly around the harbour. Then if anyone's got anything else to add to that. The, the, generally, the, 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 I know there's news in, in new science coming out all the time on this and the, the direction of travel is sea level rise might well happen higher and faster but as ben said the sensitivity tests lead us to the same strategic options in the main the challenge will be that it will mean we have to do all that work sooner and faster and the costs will probably be uh, need to be found uh earlier than we would otherwise on our Ben mentioned a fee pro funding profile earlier. Um, that funding profile would be condensed, so that would call into question the deliverability of it as well. Um, but generally, the rule of thumb: sea level rise, if it happens sooner and faster and higher, um, from a strategic point of view, we've got the flexibility to deal with that here for the hundred years. I guess the question mark is what do we, what's the risk longer term beyond that? But again, that's not what what we're guided to appraise in this project at the moment. OK, thank you, Alan. I am going to come, if that's OK, to Councillor uh, Luscombe. Bob, I know you've probably been frustrated with your Apple Mac not wanting to do the polls. Um, you've put a few things within the um, the chat, Bob. Do you want to pray see as a question to the team? You're on mute at the moment, Bob. There you I'm go. Still muted. I'm not sure if I'm not. muted or not. Uh, keep trying, Bob. We can hear you. Right. right. Uh, no. 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 No, don't worry, Bob. We've picked up. It's in the chat. Um, I will pray see it myself. So if you go back on, um, can we just mute? I'm just going to mute you, Bob. Sorry, we're getting feedback. I do apologise. Um, we'll pray see it in a minute, Bob, and come back to it. Is there any more questions from um, the other participants? Any other councillors? Geoffrey Blunt and Geoffrey, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It, it um, on on looking at um, uh, Highcliff, it would seem the um the schemes which have been put in on groundwater have been very successful over the years but when when you reach sort of chute and bunny then start to go west um i appreciate probably the um the cliffs are different but intervention then on groundwater schemes would seem to be something which needs to be really pushed forward would what what are your views on that OK, who would like to take that? Thanks, Geoffrey. Yeah, Alan? so. Ben, Ben. OK, okay. Um, so yeah, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. I think the geology does change as you move from high cliff to. To the east, um, the Barton on Sea being 
potentially the most challenging area of geology to manage. Um, the high cliff groundwater drainage scheme that is in place in that cliff has worked really successfully uh, in stabilising that area. But as you move to the east at Barton, um, it, it is more challenging. Our leading option at Barton on Sea does include groundwater management and cliff drainage to manage that risk. Um, but it is accepted that it is more challenging and more costly to do that than a, than a high cliff, hence the high cost of that Barton along that Barton frontage. Thanks, Ben. Anyone want to add to that? Mm, we have a raised hand. Peter. Hi, Peter. Yeah, yeah I, could, I could just um, add, add to what Ben was saying there. Um, the drainage at Barton is sort of older than the drainage at uh, high cliff. Um, as you say, there are differences with the, uh, so it's, it's been in, installed for, for a longer period um, and has failed in areas, although it is it's, it's been there sort of 50 odd years. Um, there is differences in the geology and there is more instability uh, potentially uh, with the slip surfaces within the upper, the sort of middle and upper Barton as which you move into as you move around the bay. Um, I mean, also um, these days, um, the triple SI, um, the, the 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 fact that there's a triple SI through that whole section whole whole um whole section of, of cliffs uh, does uh, does have an impact or a, 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 um, a, a bearing on what defences can be installed and particularly the drainage um, so that there's a balance really between what's environmentally uh, sort of acceptable in this day and age as it were um and 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 what what is what is possible so there's a few it has changed over time and um the the goalposts are different and the situation is is sort of we, we're we're um encountering is different now yeah if I, can, I might just come back on that i think uh, I, probably outside this meeting I'd, I'd probably like to sort of talk further on that because definitely with 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 nash as you as you move to Barton, um, you know, we have a number of, uh, that's when the properties start to kick in at Barton. Um, but I, I'm, I'm struggling to get my mind round why the, um, it has been so successful at Highcliffe, and then suddenly we get to Chewton Bunny. Basically, then nothing was done, and then we go into this this area of, of instability. But I guess I'm oversimplifying it. Okay. Um, I, mean, I mean, clearly, um, there is a link uh, as well between you know the coastal process side of things. So by defending the uh, uh, sort of Highcliffe end, you know that has. You know, reduced or, or had an impact on on the set of sediment movement through there, and Nash has particularly been affected as, as a result. Uh, so it's a combination of things. It, it is complex, as as you say. Um, and um, but we, you know, uh, we are um, you know the council are actually looking at uh, a number of measures to to try and uh, to, to investigate what type of drainage could could be taken forward. And um, but we need the the strategy in place properly until we can then sort of further those a bit a bit a bit better but but work is certainly definitely underway already on, on looking at some um some developing thanks. some of the uh, options thanks pete um i just wanted i've spotted steve cook's got his hand up he's been waiting patiently sorry matt steve got there first um before we move on and we will need to move on soon steve floor yeah, is yours. sorry sorry I, I was just going to say to jeff's question we can um pick up and discuss in greater detail um so sort of with, with Jeff, myself and Pete um, to go through sort of questions around Barton. OK, that's great. Thanks, Steve. Matt, did you want to add before we move on? Yeah, just to sort of clarify a couple of the positions. It's, some of it's around the, the sort of timing of the funding and the funding rules, you know, and when some of these some of these um, schemes were put in place. Um, and, and it's been it's more difficult now to get some of the funding. So that's part of the reason why there's different approaches. Um, the niche section, obviously, the, you know, we haven't got the properties on top, hence why it's not it's not sort of had the case for for um, a scheme before. But what I would say is, you know, with, with the strategy being finalised, um, what we've always talked about from the start of the strategy is it would allow us to, to lobby where where there are um, perhaps funding rules which don't favour areas like Barton on Sea. Um, so, you, you know, you're right to challenge that. You know, I think the fact that we've got a buffer zone on top of the cliff 
um, which means that the cost benefit analysis is affected because they're effectively they're sort of farther in the time frame before properties are affected. Well, actually, the, the, the real situation for that is, you know, what, why would we leave it until we're eating into the properties before we make a decision on building a scheme? Surely it should be done, um, you know, sooner than that. So, you know, completely um, understanding of the situation. And I think it should allow us to demonstrate to DEFRA, to the Environment Agency, where perhaps we think the funding rules um, have a negative impact on certain types of frontages like Barton. Um, and hopefully in the future, we might see funding rule changes to, to recognise that, that constraint that we've got. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Matt, for that. We are going to now move on, um, folks. I am a timekeeper and we need to move with the time so we're going back to peter and um, so we're going to now talk about um, engagement round five um how we can help inform the fsm strategy peter floor is yours thank you um well first should say on behalf of the team we're very grateful that you've taken the trouble to and the time to attend this event this evening and are engaged in the strategy um so far nearly uh, 12,000 people have viewed the strategy website information approximately five and a half thousand have engaged with our social media posts and uh, 680 people have attended our face-to-face -face and online events and over 250 people have completed a survey um so those early engagements have all been leading up to this stage, the statutory public consultation on the draft FSM strategy. Uh, the formal three month period for the consultation commenced on the 5th of June uh, with, with a press briefing issued to promote it, um, the start of it. During the period, this period, an online survey is being conducted to allow stakeholders to give their views on the leading options for the strict six uh, strategy zones. We are keen to uh, seek as many views as possible on the draft strategy and the more surveys completed this gives us a better sample size and therefore greater insight into general opinion giving more value to the data. In order to do this where possible we would like your help in promoting the consultation to all stakeholders including residents, businesses and local community groups to encourage them to share their views on proposed leading options on how to manage coastal flood and erosion risk across the strategy the next 100 years. But uh, via the website, it is possible to access a wealth of supporting information, including the engagement uh, phase reports produced uh, of previous stages, plus links to the earlier development uh, report, the long list and shortlist reports, which form the development basis behind the leading options of report, together with the accompanying strategic environmental assessment. Um, it is, however, appreciated that these reports are quite technical. Uh, so there's a, there, there is also a useful consultation document to assist, which clearly explains the process and concisely presents the leading options for the different units, a bit like the way the Ben went round earlier. Um, alongside this is the draft strategy document, which is a colourful and engaging booklet and which, chap, which uses chapters to lead the through, reader through the, the whole strategy process in a clear and illustrative manner, which should hopefully be a very useful resource to enable stakeholders to make informed comments. Um, in, in addition to the survey um, comments on the FSM strategy area um, can then or can also be made by dropping pins into the onto a strategy map, um, which allows remarks to be made about specific areas if required. Um, as before, two face to face exhibition events have been arranged to present the leading options to the public and to provide an opportunity to discuss in person more of the detail with members of the team. The first of these is being held tomorrow between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. at Milford on Sea Community Centre. This is a joint event with the Hearst to Lymington strategy, whom we've been working with collaboratively and who are at the stage of conducting their final round of engagement on the adjacent section of coastline. Um, the second face to face event will be held on Monday, the 19th of June. Uh, at Christchurch Library, and that event runs from 10 a.m. to half past five. Um, an online presentation similar to this will be given to the public on Tuesday, the 27th of June, between 7 and 8.15, again hosted by the Dorset Coastal Forum, with tickets available through Eventbrite. Um, in addition to this, the strategy will have representation at the at, on um, NFDC's climate and coast themed stand for three days at the New Forest Show. Uh, to, paint, to obtain a paper copy of the survey and consultation documents, uh, these are available at local libraries. Um, 
the consultation will close at midnight on the on Sunday, the 27th of August, 2023. <laughs> um, so what are the next steps? Um, once the consultation ends, the feedback will be analysed and considered during the autumn and winter with appropriate modifications made to finalise the strategy in terms of the leading options and the strategic environment assessment. Work will then be undertaken to get approval from the Environment Agency and Natural England on the habitats regulations, the Marine Conservation Zone and Water Framework Directive assessments, which considers the impacts of the leading options. Following this, the process to seek adoption by both BCP Council and NFDC will be undertaken through various council committees. Depending on the time required to gain that these approvals, the strategy will then seek approval from the Environment Agency's large project review group by the project, project spokes, um, sponsors, and that will happen during early 2024. And following on in spring, that spring of that year will be engagement round six, which is an opportunity to share the final adopted and approved strategy with stakeholders and discuss what it means and what happens next. Again, this is likely to be in the form of drop-in sessions where the final strategy will be presented to the public. Thank you, Thank you Peter. Great. So uh, questions at this point. Uh, Catherine has been bobbing into the chat various links. People have asked about those. We will make sure that you get those links. Um, but we would like to just pop back to um, Bob's question on um, long shore drift. So I'm just going to read it out, Bob, if that's OK. Um, so um, there is no doubt based on underwater filming that long shore drift in is impacting both Beer Pan Rocks and Christchurch Ledge. The drift then flows into Christchurch Bay with increasing sandbars seen at low tide. This potentially um, then could impact areas such as um, Muddyford Quay due to potentially high swell overtopping. So I'm just scrolling down. Right. Um, can I ask Ben or Matt, would you like to comment on that particular? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go first if you like. I think um, yeah, I mean, long, long, longshore drift, you know, it's certainly something we see across across the two bays. We've got a um, a two bays model of sediment transport, which our principal scientists sort of hosts, um, Mike 21 model. Um, I think it's always been a phenomenon of, of the bay. We, in a sense of controlling that, we're, we are, um, we have the two sort of scheme areas as it were so the pool bay area um and the beach management there we've got the long groin at hengsbury head which um gives us some element of control of sediment bypassing uh hengsbury head itself that's due to be rebuilt um next spring um so as part of the pool bay beach management scheme um that is that is in plan for for reconstruction then we're doing the design at the moment and we have suppliers on board um for that construction um and yeah i think you know the 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 sort of I guess the changes around sort of Christchurch Bay and the mouth of Christchurch Harbour uh, you know have always been a a, a, um, a known factor there there's been recycling in in the past of some of the offshore sandbars I think the local option we talked about for that frontage could include recycling which could include um, the you know, and, and correct me if I'm wrong there Ben and Alan it could include um, recycling in the in the form of taking material from the sandbars like we've done in the past in Christchurch. I think the other part of your question as well, Bob, in, in which you put later on in the chat was around the risk of breach of Mudderford Spit. And and we've talked about that at, uh, at project level um, and the ability potentially for us in the future to bed in the Mudderford Spit part into the broader Pool Bay beach management because we we also recognise that a breach of of Mudderford Spit um, could have impacts for Hengsbury Head and the Paul Baby Management Scheme as well. So in some ways, that's you know it used to be there were borders there for each of the individual authorities, but now at BCP, you know we're not de delivering projects with those borders, and obviously we're working jointly with with New Forest as well. But looking at that more holistically, um, maybe bedding in recycling and beach management on the Mudderford Spit area as part of the Paul Baby Management scheme um, could be a way of bringing in funding um, more broadly to allow that to happen. So sorry, I think I've got, I think I've answered a couple of different points on there, but hopefully that's clarified. OK, thanks. Well, welcome to thanks. our discussions offline in future, if, if Bob would like on, on that. Great. Part. 
That's lovely. Thank you. I just wanted to ask um, before we start wrapping up, did anyone have any particular questions about engagement and the plans for engagement? Any questions on that for either um, Peter or Catherine? Feel free to unmute. No, that's, that's quite clear. It seemed very clear to me. So um, I hope it all goes brilliantly, all those events that are planned. So next we have Life, the last poll before we let you go, and that really is on, on just how you found the information. Um, the team always like to know whether they're producing the, too much, is it too technical, is it about right, the audience, or not enough, would you have preferred more? So if you wouldn't mind just submitting your answers for that, and then we shall round up and finish on time, which is always good. Um, I'd just like to apologise for any technical issues that you may have had. Um, it isn't the team and it wasn't us, it is the, the functionality of, of, of Teams has let us down somewhat, but we got there eventually. Apologies to Bob, I know you struggle, we'll make sure that that's covered off. Um, and for those of you that were struggling to, uh, to log in, we made it in the end and it's been a really good meeting. Okay, so I think all responses are in. I think that's pretty clear. That's great. Thank you very much. Can we have the next slide, please? So um, this is the end. We will be finishing on time. Two minutes to go. Um, there is an email contact point for the project. Um, it's on the screen. Website is there too. You should be able to click on it um, and go to the link. We will provide all of the, the links, all of the things that Catherine has kindly put in the chat. Thank you to all of the presenters. Um, we've done really well to get through all that and to all your councillors and the new councillors. Thank you very much for joining. Um, I was Sarah, joined by Nikki from the Dorset Coast Forum. We do enjoy facilitating and we thank you for your time. Um, it's a sunny summer. We should be outside enjoying probably a Pims or maybe a gin and tonic or a Coca-Cola or a cup of tea. You can go and have one now. Thank you ever so much. And we will all log off. I'll let you go now. Thank you so much. And spread, spread the news, spread the links, get people to go. You need to get people to participate. OK. Thank you. So you can all just right. let yourself out. Bye bye, folks. Very nice to meet you all.